gone in a couple of those kicks. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I just got done uh, juicing. Oh, no That's way. my thing. Yeah. See, I Every bought a day. juicer. I bought a nice-ass juicer, and mm-hmm. um, it just gets so dirty. Oh, man. You're, just la- <laughs> you're lazy. <laughs> I am. That's true. That's true. It's, you just got to do it. It's like a ritual. Mm-hmm. You do it and, uh, you know, go through whatever, clean it, and it doesn't take that much time. Right. I'm hoping once uh, I get out of the 9 to 5 life, I'll be able to dedicate more time to those kind of activities because I drag myself out of the bed at the last possible minute, mm-hmm. jump in the car, and go to work. And so I don't really want to have time for shit like right. that. Right. Gotcha. Understood. Yeah, but I definitely uh, notice the difference from uh, juicing all the time. What kind of stuff do you juice? Because when I did it, everything kind of tasted the same. Uh, I'm sure the, your listening audience is fascinated by this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's always different, man. I just, I have, uh, we get a box. We belong to one of those com- community supported agriculture things. So, oh, that's cool. so we, yeah, we started getting one of these, and it's like, man, what do you do with some of this? Uh, stuff you know and just, i don't want to waste it so typically like today i uh, had all kinds of stuff had uh, you know carrots and apple and grape but also stuff like a uh, turnip celery uh, put a little ginger in there oh uh, now that's exotic some chard it's whatever's there you just got it when you're doing it like if i'm just making it for myself i go pretty hardcore but <laughs> If I'm doing it for my wife, I'll make it sweeter, put in more apples, you know, so it's not as radical. Uh, <laughs> and and yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and so this one was, yeah, pretty interesting. It also had a lemon and tangerine in there, so, you know, it's got a uh, bite to it. But uh, if you do it all the time, you, can, you definitely can tell the effects. I'm, you know, very pro-juicing. Part of the movement. That's mm-hmm. uh, the awakening. A lot of people seem to be taking diet into account, which makes a lot of sense. So you got this Historia Discordia website. Tell us about that a little bit, man. It looks like it's filling up. There's a lot of content on there now, more than there was last time we talked. Yeah, and it'll uh, we'll keep adding more stuff. I've been uh, working behind the scenes. See, I you know there's this huge archive that got uh, passed on to me, and so. Uh, and coming out of that are these different book projects. One's the history of Discordianism. That should be out in a couple months. It's looking at like Historia Discordian. That's what the website is named as well. And but you know there's also materials on uh, Carrie Thornley and uh, the Garrison investigation. So that's a second book that'll probably be out mid to late year. Feral House is going to publish that, and a couple more book projects, probably several. There's different materials I think that can be would lend themselves to uh, be putting out strictly as a Kindle. So, working on these book projects, it's like time and again when you're doing the layouts, uh, the uh, folks doing will say, "Well, we need a better scan or a photo of this. It doesn't look too good." So, oh, okay, got to go in. <laughs> go into these archives again because it's immense finding one little piece of paper so as i've been doing this going through again i've been kind of uh, putting together future content for the uh, website uh, materials that won't be in the books you know and it so it made uh, sense there's a lot of stuff i want people to see so the things that aren't going to be in the books are ending up on the uh, website and i've set all all these folders for future posts and I, you know, probably got, uh, 50 different folders of stuff. (laughs) So there'll be enough material, uh, to keep this, uh, website, uh, the content fresh and going for, you know, a few years at least fun. Yeah. Websites looking good. I got a lot of help from my publisher at Fiji press. who goes by the handle of Groucho Gandhi. He's kind of the webmaster and he also has a portion of the, uh, archives there where he lives i won't say where he lived but he's on the other side of the country right on powerful stuff man busy keeping busy yeah. oh hell yeah <laughs> i saw you post a week or so ago about one of uh tila tequila's ramblings you should send her an application to be a high priestess of discordianism <laughs> she would fit I, the bill right <laughs> oh hell yeah I, I was funny I, yeah some post on about she was invoking eris 
And I thought, oh, that's weird. I, you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't know how much uh, I want to cozy up to her. It probably discredit everything I'm uh, doing. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've been actually trying to get her to come on the show because. Oh, well, that, well, that would be fun. Yeah. I, yeah. That, she makes such wild claims. Like she well, said, uh, well, I don't know if you knew, but she said like some of the things recently, Paul Walker was an Illuminati sacrifice. Uh, she says that. She's performed her own ritualistic murders to be in the club. I mean, she straight up said, like, it reminds me of the time I had a ritualistic murder. And I'm like, you can't just say that. There's, like, legal ramifications for saying <laughs> shit like that. So you, you've reached out to her people? Well, she has her own Tila Truth blog or something like that. Anonymous, it's called Anon Truth Blog. And that's her website. And she on there, she goes by Tequila Truth. And... Mm -hmm. uh, I've tried. I've emailed all the different various things. A lot of them come back where you get that message. You get that automated immediate message that says, like, this address is no longer valid. Um, I've been getting a lot of those. So out of the five addresses I can find for, three of them have sent me back this address is no longer in existence messages. So I don't know what the hell she's doing. But A lot of times the best way to get a hold of these people are through their publicists. I think she's on her own at this point. You think she's got a publicist still? Oh, man, a lot of this just seems like uh, publicity to me. To well, keep yeah. Game out there. I don't know. Is she still doing uh, TV shows? I don't uh, really keep up. <laughs> well, she's not really doing any TV shows, but she just put out this uh, performance art piece called Tila Tequila Backdoored and Squirting. And she said, <laughs> she, uh, but what's interesting about it is she breaks into a British accent. And which some people, of course, in the alternative community are alluding to being an altar. Um, but I just think that she might be fucking around. Like, she's heard about the Britney Spears situation. And she wants to say, I'm special too, guys. Like, I'm like that. Uh, so in the middle of her porn shoot, she breaks into a British accent just to get attention <laughs> that she wasn't going to get otherwise. Yeah, it's like she's going through a list of uh, things to touch upon. You know, this latest invoking the goddess Eris. Where You know, where'd she... <laughs> <laughs> right. pull that out yeah so i don't know but i i would love to sit with her for an hour and let her make ridiculous statement after ridiculous statement and just just for the fun of it but oh i want to be in on that yeah well if she ever gets back to me for sure and that's what's <laughs> crazy is i'm like there aren't there can't be a lot of people banging down your door and i'm trying pretty hard professor griff's another one i haven't been able to get a hold of although that's a little bit more of a serious request <laughs> oh yeah he's cool well, I think it's about that time. I think we're going to call in Michael Cremo. I'm going to play a little ad for the THC Money Bomb, which is doing pretty well. This newest one has already hit 100 bucks. We got like four weeks to go. So donate to THC. Get in the pool for that. You know, get a conspiracy. I'll let the commercials do that. There's no point in talking about it and then playing a commercial. Uh, and we'll be on the other side with Michael Cremo. We're here because we don't buy into the bullshit of mainstream culture. We're tired of the mundane, passionless careers we've been shuffled into as a result of this orchestrated, debt-based system of rule, and the stranglehold on education and entertainment by cold, soulless corporations. People, yes, we are frustrated. Yes, we are tired. And we reject the pre-approved tranquilizers that are Monday Night Football and an ice-cold Budweiser. But we have to stop hiding. Stop hiding behind the headphones and the Cherry Popper 420 username. Let the world see that the resistance is strong and society is changing. There was a time to be anonymous, but that time has passed. And so the Higher Side Chats would like to present conspiracies as the dawning of this new paradigm in the uniform of the revolution. Because bold fashion should mean more than some celebrity meat dress or frat boy in a silly pink polo. Conspiracies redefines bold fashion as having the balls to reject socially uncomfortable and unpopular truths from your radiant chest all fucking day. Conspiratees.net. Let them know that you know. Bold designs for troubled times. Hard truths. Soft talk. Hey, people, I got to take a second to tell you about something we do around here called the THC Money Bomb. What I do is every five episodes, I total up the donations I've gotten in that period of time, and half keeps me and the show going. I take the other half, and I gift that back to a random listener. So far, we're hitting about 500 each round, and I couldn't be happier about it. So consider throwing in five or ten bucks. It's cheaper than a hand at the blackjack table with better odds than a scratch-off ticket. Plus, you know half supports a show you like, and at the very least, half will go to a like-minded person who could probably use a nice 
surprise in these troubled times. When you make a donation, I can see your email address, and that's how I pick the winner. But to keep things kosher, you can also get in the pool by sending your info on a postcard to me, Greg Carlwood, P.O. Box 635223, San Diego, California, 92163. I got no subscription fees here, no paid archives, no paid bonus shows, and I want to keep it that way, on principle. But I'm not a millionaire of the podcast on the side. This is it for me. And I'm the only one I know who's trying to help the people out as well. That's my man! So help me help you. If you want to play along, go to thehiresidechats.com slash donate and get in the game. Dollars, bitcoins, it's all good to me. And that's what we call the THC Money Bomb. Boom. All right, people, as we explore the depths of misinformation and narrative control that has been so graciously bestowed upon us, we have to reassess almost everything we know in certain areas. And one of those huge areas is our ancient past and the real timeline of humanity. Well, today's guest is the perfect guy to help us look at some of the evidence and writings that contradict our official story. Michael Cremo has been studying this field for many years and has authored several books on these topics, including Forbidden Archaeology, Human Devolution, The Hidden History of the Human Race, and most recently, My Science, My Religion. He's the powerhouse of the alternative history field, and I'm damn pleased to have him here. Michael Mann, how the hell are you? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot. And I, I hope you and all your listeners are also feeling fine. Yeah, better every day, man. Uh, it is truly an honor. I just, I hope I can keep up with you on this one. I mean, I guess the best way to start would be to say that we've heard from a lot of people who think that humanity is a lot older than we're led to believe, and I'm there. You got me. But there's still many different views of the alternative history world some think we've had periods of technology that rival what we have today. Some people think that we may have started on Mars. Some people think we've been educated or even engineered by an alien race. So there's many different thoughts on this. And uh, just so we set the stage for the people listening, can you give us your perspective with a little overview of how you see humanity's timeline, if you wouldn't mind? Well, I'm very much influenced in my work by my studies in the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, which have a, a cyclical concept of time. Mm -hmm. you know, time goes in vast cycles. So in all of these cycles, according to these ancient texts, humans have been present. So I would expect to find a human presence going all the way back to the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. Most scientists today would say humans like us first appeared less than 200,000 years ago on Earth, and their claim is all the evidence supports that idea. But if you actually look, as I have, into the entire history of archaeology and look at all of the reports, not the ones that we see in today's textbooks, but all of them, you'll see numerous discoveries of human bones, human footprints, human artifacts going back many millions of years, all the way back to the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. Wow. Is there any type of techniques for dating? Because I've heard like carbon dating, which is, of course, the most popular, most known about method of dating old things. I've heard it only works up to a certain point. Is there a technique that stretches back further or is that uh, misinformation? Well, you're correct that the radiocarbon method of dating has a, a very short period of time in wh which it's applicable. You know, it, it's based on the concept that the body contains a type of radioactive carbon called carbon-14. And if an element is radioactive, that means it decays into other elements. Uh, in what's called a half-life. And the half-life of uh, carbon-14 is about 5,000 years. So that means after 5,000 years, half of it's gone. Another 5,000 years, half of what's left is gone. Gotcha. And so on. By the time you go back about 20 half-lives or about 100,000 years, there's no more left to measure. So that's why that, that, uh, that method only works back to about 100,000 years. There's another method that can be used on bone, and that's the uranium series method. It goes back about a few hundred thousand years because 
the uh, the the uh, half life of the radioactive elements is longer than the carbon half life. So, but once you go back that far, there aren't any methods that will allow you to directly date human bones or any other type of bones. Therefore, scientists have to rely on dating of the age of the formations, the layers of rock in which bones and human artifacts may be found. So there are methods that radiometric methods that allow them to date layers of rock of different kinds. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, for example, there's the potassium argon method, which is used to date volcanic types of, of rock. And that method can go back millions and millions of years. But you, you don't use it to date the object or bone itself. You use it to date the layers of rock in which objects are found. So, yes, there are different dating methods, and they are applied in different ways. Right on. And let me ask you another question. I mean, considering all the research you've done on these ancient Sanskrit texts, what would you walk us through a couple of your favorite writings? I mean, a lot of people consider these things to be fiction or moral tales or fables, but, I mean, it makes sense to me that it would be a historical account. People would start writing down what's going on. Um, but what are some of your favorite stories that are really interesting about that that suggest maybe a few, another technology or some type of other communication? Well, you're right. These writings contain historical elements. They contain philosophical elements. They contain all kinds of things. As far as descriptions of advanced technologies, I would say what I find most interesting is the descriptions of flying machines and spaceships. They're mm-hmm. called the manas. And there are many different kinds because... The uh, ancient Sanskrit texts say we live in a multi-level cosmos where the energies at the different levels are of different kinds. Some are more dense, some are more subtle energies. And there are descriptions of vimanas or spacecraft that operate in different energy fields. Some of them are made of ordinary metals like steel and iron and others are made of more subtle energies and there are descriptions of all different kinds. So I find that fascinating. I also find fascinating uh, the descriptions of weapons resembling modern nuclear weapons. Yeah. The ancient Sanskrit texts describe a weapon called a Brahmastra. And if you look at the description, it said when it goes off, when this weapon goes off, it's as if you had millions of suns all gathered together in one place. It sounds very much like what occurs when you have the explosion of an atomic weapon. And actually, I find it very interesting that Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, who was the scientist in charge of the American project to develop an atomic bomb during World War II was, in addition to being a great physicist, was also a great student of the ancient Sanskrit writings. Mm -hmm. And when the first United States atomic bomb was tested in 1945 at Alamogordo in New Mexico, he was there in the bunker when it was set off. And when it was set off, and when that huge light lit up the sky like a million suns all in one place, he began reciting Sanskrit text from these ancient Sanskrit writings. So I think that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I had heard that before, and I always thought it was fairly cryptic, um, what he said. And yeah, there definitely seemed to be some type of thing he was conveying that he wasn't really saying outright. Interesting guy he was. Now, there are a lot of cultures that have ancient stories or legends that involve mating with another race or hybridization uh, with some type of uh, otherworldly intelligence. I mean, do you consider these to be historic accounts, or is there some hyperbole there? Well, I 
think there can be some truth to these things because even in modern science, uh, we're seeing some very unusual manipulations of the reproduction patterns of different animals. There are things like interspecies embryo transfer where they'll transfer the embryo of a creature of one species into the womb of another of another species and you know the mother will give birth to a creature that's not of her own species and of course there are hybrid plants there are hybrid animals there so i i'm 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 not surprised by some of the accounts that we see in uh, the writings of different ancient wisdom traditions that talk about celestial terrestrial hybrids. Uh, for example, the uh, Sanskrit text, the Mahabharata, is uh, a text that talks about these things. There are uh, five heroes called the Pandavas. They were five brothers, and they were uh, fighting for the cause of right and justice and truth on earth against the forces of darkness. And each of these five brothers, their mother was terrestrial, but their fathers were extraterrestrial beings, according to the accounts. So we see this in a lot of ancient wisdom traditions. The uh, Traditionally, the Japanese emperors are said to be descended from uh, a, a terrestrial mother who, who mated with celestial beings. So we see this in a lot of different wisdom traditions, this idea of terrestrial celestial uh, hybrids and I, I I think it's 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 the possibility of such things is definitely there yeah man I mean there's just too many cultures that reference that kind of stuff and also just give, being given knowledge by sky people and uh, it's kind of funny because even in religions it's it's just weird because how would in modern times translating the difference between Gods and aliens seems almost impossible because you're talking about people who came from the sky, more advanced, have more technology, and it's almost like a given that they were probably trying to describe some type of, or it's more down to earth to think they were trying to describe some type of real being than some kind of idea of a god. But um, Well, the way I look at it, I mean, I, I appeared in the series ancient aliens that aired on the History Channel over the past few years and is still airing. And my take on it is the two things aren't contradictory. I think there can be both things. Really? One thing doesn't rule out the other. I think, yeah, there can be other human-like beings from other parts of the universe with more, uh, more uh, advanced technology, and I think there can also be higher beings from more subtle realms of reality that have also uh, visited the Earth, perhaps with different purposes in mind. So I don't think that the idea of ancient aliens or ancient astronauts rules out the possibility that there could also be, in addition to those creatures, higher beings, gods, goddesses, some supreme conscious being I, I i don't think the two things are necessarily contradictory but that's my take on it and everybody's got to make up their own minds about these things mm -hmm. that's fair hey michael adam here i had a question you kind of just answered it uh you talked about multi-level cosmos, which kind of says to me multiple alternate dimensions we live in and the subtle energies within those. Um, would those account for uh, ghost sightings and, you know, some paranormal UFO sightings? I would say yes. Here's the way I look at ghosts. First of all, it means we have to understand what a human being is really made of. 
Mm-hmm. Now, today, many scientists will say a human being or any other, other living thing is just a machine made of molecules, and that's all there is to it. But I think there is more to it. I think a human being is made of three things. Ordinary matter, we have a gross physical body made of the chemical elements. But beyond that, I think we have a subtle body made of mind and intelligence, subtle energies. Uh, And in, in that subtle or astral body, sometimes we travel out of the body. And then beyond that, there is a conscious self. The, uh, and there's evidence for this that sometimes uh, you know, people have out-of-body experiences. So I think a human being is made of mind, matter, and consciousness. And when I say consciousness and mind, I mean things that have their own independent existence. Many scientists would say, well, mind and consciousness, that's just some dem- temporary byproduct of bioelectrical activity in the brain. And as soon as the chemicals in the brain are disorganized, no more mind, no more consciousness. I don't believe that. I think mind and consciousness have their own independent existence. So sometimes, and I also believe in reincarnation. So here's how I would explain ghost. Uh, Sometimes when a person dies, the normal process is their gross physical form dies, but the subtle mental body and the soul or the conscious self still exist. And based on the condition of the subtle mental body, the person will get another gross physical body. But sometimes what happens is a person doesn't get another gross physical body and they're stuck. The conscious self and the subtle mental body are stuck. And then they try to take uh, possession of another gross physical body or manipulate things, you know, Mm -hmm. move things around and stuff like that. So uh, they get stuck on that more subtle realm. So, yeah, I think this idea of different energy levels or different dimensions of reality and different substances that make up what a living thing actually is does go a long way in explaining uh, phenomena such as ghosts and other paranormal phenomena. Yeah, I think that makes sense, too. And, I mean, of course, you're very much into Eastern spirituality, and I've dabbled with psychedelics. I know Adam has as well, but I think both of those things lead people to that similar place of examining consciousness as something closer to the core of what a person is rather than the three-dimensional body. And for people who entertain that possibility of being that internal energy manifesting itself in a three-dimensional reality to experience the world as this illusion of separateness, to bring it back to uh, forbidden archaeology, it seems like such a powerful design. And to think that it would only exist on this planet for such a small amount of time, uh, as the mainstream suggests, I mean, that seems like a waste of such a enormously complex system. I mean, you'd think it would exist on other planets for sure. Yeah, well, you know, ideas are beginning to change a little bit, even within the world of mainstream science. You know, I'm a member of the World Archaeological Congress, which is the, one of the world's largest international organization of archaeologists. And every four years, they hold a congress, a big meeting in a different city in the world. And the last couple of meetings that they've held, as part of their official congresses, conferences, they've had sections where they discuss extraterrestrial archaeology. In in other words, what if we're not alone in uh, the universe? What if when we go to other planets, archaeologists find the remains of other civilizations and things like that? And most countries, including the United States, at one time or another have funded what they call SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Yeah. And now we're starting to see a a lot of reports in the news about discoveries of 
planets, Earth-like planets orbiting suns and other solar systems and other parts of the galaxy. This is uh, becoming very common. I, you know, I just heard some reports uh, just the other day in looking uh, through the news reports. So this is something that I think we're, we're gradually being prepared to accept that we're not alone in the cosmos. I think Stephen Hawking, you know, he's a famous astrophysicist, yeah, yeah. has uh, said within the past couple of years that we're not alone in the universe. So it's, it's something that I think is becoming more and more acceptable, even within you know, the mainstream circles. They're gradually creeping in that direction. Well, this is kind of close to another question I was going to ask you is there's a lot of people in the alternative community that suggest sometimes from ancient writings, sometimes other things that we visited the moon or even came from Mars in the ancient past. Do you, have you seen anything to suggest that that would be true or lead you to believe there might be some credence to those kind of stories? Well, the way I look at it is we're part of a whole cosmic hierarchy of beings. According to the ancient Sanskrit writings, there are 400,000 human-like species scattered throughout the cosmos on uh, different levels of reality. So I wouldn't be surprised at all you know, to uh, learn that, well, we're related to other intelligent, conscious beings who exist in other parts of our solar system, of our galaxy, of our universe. I wouldn't be surprised at all. However, you know, in, in, in one sense, I think we're all extraterrestrials in, in this sense, that we are made of matter, mind, and consciousness. And I think that conscious self has an origin on some higher level of reality that I call the level of pure consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I think, and that's beyond the material universes. So I think we're all, whether we're, we're now existing in, as you were t calling them, three-dimensional uh, material bodies and on the Earth or Mars or wherever, some planet orbiting some sun and some other solar system, whatever, we're all ultimately from the same place. We're all ultimately related to each other. And it's just under the influence of some very incorrect ideas about reality that we divide ourselves on this Earth even into so many different competing uh, groups. So... I would kind of stress the unity, ultimately, of all conscious beings. And that makes sense, too. So to bring this back down to Earth, pun intended, and talk about archaeology, outside of these ancient texts and old oral traditions, I mean, are there any major archaeological finds or structures that you'd consider to throw the biggest wrench in the conventional ideas about our human history? Oh, there are... Numerous. Hundreds of such cases. They were enough. To get a, I mean, my book, Forbidden Archaeology, is 900 pages long, and <laughs> yes. it's full of hundreds of cases of like that. I mean, some. I mean, some of my favorite examples are uh, the California gold mine discoveries. For example, during the gold rush days, miners were digging tunnels into the sides of mountains in the Sierra Nevada mountains in, uh, near uh, the town of Sonora. And deep inside the tunnels in the solid rock, they were finding human skeletons. They were finding obsidian spear points, stone mortars and pestles, all kinds of stone tools and weapons. And these were found in layers of rock that modern geologists consider to be about 50 million years old. They were reported to the scientific world by Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was the chief government geologist of California. His report was published by Harvard University. But, you know, we, we don't hear about these things very much today because of 
what I call a process of knowledge filtration that operates in the world of science. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, there were other scientists who lived at the same time as Dr. Whitney, like Dr. William Holmes, who was an anthropologist at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. He said, if Dr. Whitney had understood uh, the theory of human evolution, he wouldn't have published that report. In other words, there's a tendency among scientists to ignore, reject, and dismiss discoveries that radically contradict dominant theories and accepted ideas. And if that just happened once or twice, well, maybe you could overlook it. But if it happens hundreds of times, then I think you've got to ask, what's going on here? So there, I mean, I always find it fascinating not just that there are these discoveries of human bones, human artifacts, human footprints going back millions of years before mainstream science thinks that humans like us first came into existence. The discoveries themselves are interesting, but what's also interesting is how the discoveries are treated, this process of knowledge filtration that operates in the world of science. Yes, I'm really, really interested in that area, specifically the, the subject of information control. And there's different schools of thought, of course. I mean, there are some researchers in the conspiracy realm who suggest that people in control of the world today are actually members of a specific network of people that have probably been in control throughout several mass extinction level catastrophes. And then they keep this information very close to the chest and put forth structures where they will remain on top of the pyramid. Uh, and that this goes on for centuries and centuries with certain families and bloodlines. I mean, and that is that is far out stuff. For a lot of people, that just seems like way too hard to believe. Um, but sometimes when I see this type of information filtration, I'm like, is it just the ego of people who've been studying this for a long time? Or are there established institutions funded by these very families that make sure that the information fits inside a certain parameter. And if it doesn't, they just dismiss that. I mean, do you think that's a possibility that you entertain, or is that just too far off the reservation? Uh, I entertain all the possibilities. I think there could be Smart. multiple things going on. Right. I mean, I think it, in some cases it, it's uh, just human nature operating. You know, For example, if I love somebody and somebody tells me something bad about the person I love, I don't want to believe it. I may even become a little angry at the person who yeah. speaks these things. So I think some scientists are like that. They're just very much in love with their theories. When they hear something that goes against it, they, they just naturally respond in a protective way to what they deeply believe and love. I think there are other elements involved as well. I think power can be uh, an element in, in this. You know, we see that... Uh, People who have power, particularly those who have monopoly power, don't like to give it up. And for uh, centuries, there's been a group of scientists uh, who have gotten a monopoly in the scientific institutions and education systems. And they're putting forward very materialistic conceptions of who we are and where we came from yep. there and, and that has that has that gives them a great deal of control over human society because the goals and values that we have are to a large extent determined by our concept of self you know, for example if I think I'm an American man that's how I behave uh, so if you can define people's existence, so you tell them you're a machine made of matter in competition with other machines made of matter for survival, then that has the effect of causing people to think that to produce and consume more and more material things is the main purpose of human life. Yeah. So they do that, that generates huge amounts of wealth that flows in an unfair way into certain pockets. And there are a lot of interests in society, financial interests, political interests, other interests, that want to see that continue. 
they don't want to see people get distracted from that. Like if people yes. had a different concept of self, I'm a being of pure consciousness that's temporarily here in this world of matter, and I should be putting, uh, uh, you know, trying to satisfy my material needs in the most simple, natural, and efficient way possible while putting most of my human energy into developing the resource of consciousness and elevating it back to its original pure state, that would be very bad yeah. in terms of the, you know, because people would be spending less time and energy producing and consuming more and more material things. That would be very bad yes, it would. Uh, for those who want to keep people absorbed in producing and consuming more and more material things to the exclusion of every other type of human value and purpose. So I think, yes, there are uh, groups of people that want to keep certain ideas intact because it keeps people focused on material production and consumption, which generates uh, wealth for corporations, financial institutions, and governments, and nobody really wants to rock the boat. Right. Yeah, I I think that's a brilliant breakdown. I mean, I've also often thought about that. You know, this type of these types of ideas they unite people. You know, which makes war tougher. It makes having sweatshops yeah. tougher. Um, Absolutely right. Our number one tool against. Um, an oppressive elite is our numbers. So if you keep us separated, we're not going to realize that power. We might not realize that it, it bothers us to have people in other countries making our stuff for pennies on the dollar. And then we might not um, get together and stand up to this power. So, yeah, I think that's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, yeah, I think there are two, basically two types of conscious uh, beings in the universe. Uh, one type is trying to get m more and more deeply involved in domination, controlling, and exploiting matter in, in competing groups. Mm -hmm. And we, therefore, we see conflict on all levels of human society, conflict among individuals, conflict among races, conflict among classes, conflict among nations, conflict among religions. You just see it. But there's another type of person conscious being who's thinking I am a being of pure consciousness I'm not just a machine made of matter in competition with others for survival we're, we're all beings of pure consciousness we're all related to each other no use in dividing ourselves into so many competing groups and uh, let's try to satisfy our material needs in the most simple natural and efficient way possible and mm -hmm. that would reverse a lot of the environmental degradation uh, that we see around us. It would stop a lot of the wars and conflict that we see going on around us. And it would be better for people yeah. overall. But, yeah. but uh, and, it, and, and I think the kind of world we live in kind of depends upon the balance between the two types of of people and who's dominant. So right. in the world, the way it's set up now, those who are into the domination, control, and exploitation, and divisions, and competition, and conflict, they're now, they've got things set up for, for their purposes. Yeah. And those of us who are uh, trying for something else are kind of on the margins at this point. I agree with you. Let's, I mean, to bring this back to the ancient past, I mean, some people suggest that there are many types of natural energy forces that we ignore or have been suppressed in our pursuit of oil and coal and nuclear and all these incredibly risky or dirty technologies. And it is easy to glorify and romanticize the past, but I mean, do you think there was ever a time where we may have had a more sophisticated and technologically advanced society where the balance was tilted more in, in the favor of probably what you or I would like in a society? Uh, yes, I think that is true. And, uh, of course, you know, we have to consider what do we mean by advance. I mean, you know, advance could mean simple living, high thinking, 
That's true. Know, yeah. I mean, it, it, if if we look at you know the people who down through history have, whose reputations have survived, you know they tend to be spiritual, spiritually minded people who were manifesting values like that. Uh, you know the the Buddhas and the Christ and the avatars and things like that. They were representing this other point of point of point of view. So uh, so I think it in the past there were and there could be today civilizations organized on a different basis than civilizations are organized today mm-hmm. now another i think i think actually i think a lot of our modern technology uh is attempts to reproduce abilities people once had naturally yeah i think people have abilities you know like there's telepathy and remote viewing and things like that uh I think our a lot of our technology today in terms of the internet and smartphones and televisions and things like that is our attempt to reproduce in technological form abilities that people once had naturally. And not only do we try to reproduce natural psychic abilities that people have in technological devices we try to do it in a way that makes them marketable yeah uh, so that you can extract wealth from people and establish control over them you know i think you know that's part of uh you could say the evil genius of uh you know capitalism uh, well, yeah, like Facebook and things like that. Now they've been able to monetize and extract wealth from people's social dealings. Right. You know, you used to just hang out with your friends. Now you have to hang out with your friends in such a way that you're being sold to advertisers and people are making money off your personal social activities. You know, it's a, yeah. kind of an interesting bargain. Well, the world is in a weird place right now because, like you're mentioning, there are major conglomerates and corporations on the Internet that are monetizing off this stuff. But at the same time, we're learning so much more than we've learned in previous generations. Uh, That connectedness is happening with us. We're seeing more of how people live on other big islands on this rock. And uh, we're realizing it's it's not that different. It's a deal. It's a deal. It's a trade-off. It is. I think there's actually there's some that, positive things, but there's some negative things that go along with it. Agreed. And I think that as the internet finds more ways, this philosophy of the internet finds more ways to manifest in 3D reality, like we're seeing 3D printers. I mean, that's the number one way. Like that's that is torrenting music right there for for objects. Um, you just duplicate things. So I think we're finding ways to. Um, bring back the veil of this perceived scarcity of all of our resources that make things more expensive and make things, you know, people can manage them for us. And we're realizing, Hey, you know, we can create stuff. Um, Bitcoin is a way that we're doing that with the financial markets. It's pretty interesting. I'm a huge fan of, I mean, that's what this show is on, you know, uh, the internet, that's where people are learning about this stuff. You're not going to see this on CNN. I'm not against it, but, uh, you know, there, I think there are different, people with different right. interests involved. Yes. The old school of thought is those, you know, those old power brokers are still trying to find a way at the same time to weasel in on our territory and benefit from it. Um, it it's definitely a strange give and take and we're lucky to be alive during this. It's pretty wild. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a, a battle that's gone on since times began. You know, like there there've always been the two types of conscious beings, those striving to become more and more deeply involved in dominating, ex- exploiting, controlling matter, and those that are looking to do, develop consciousness. So it's been going on since time began. Nothing mm-hmm. new about it. We're just getting our particular version of it today. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Michael, how important uh, 
is humankind in the role of all of this, in the role of the universe? Well, it, it's very interesting. The, in the human form, we have, we're at a crossroads. We can go either way. In the human form, it's possible for a conscious self to rise to a level of awareness where it it can rise to a stage where it no longer has to exist in contact with matter and material forms, which are temporary. Say right now, our conscious self is connected with a body that's going to get old, it's going to get sick, it's going to die, it's going to take another birth and undergo another cycle of birth and death. And in Buddhist and Vedic philosophy, this is called samsara, the wheel of birth and death. And there's all kinds of limitations placed upon consciousness on this level of reality. In the human form, it's like uh, a spaceship, a space vehicle, a very complex uh, biological uh, entity that can allow the conscious self to raise itself beyond all this and get to that level of pure consciousness where there is no birth, there is no death, there is no competition or scarcity or anything like that. So it's a it's a, it's kind of a, a a vehicle that has very advanced capabilities built into it if we choose to use them for that purpose. But uh, the way society is structured today is we're encouraged to use this very capable vehicle for other purposes and you know so I think the human vehicle is very important in the cosmos because it has that capability to take conscious selves out of this whole cycle of samsara but uh the, the human vehicle can also be used for domination, control, exploitation, and remaining entangled in samsara. So, mm -hmm. man, yeah. um, you know, another thread I wanted to pull with you just for fun are these, there's these stories that I'm fascinated with, these stories of giant skeletons. But whether, whether or not there's a cover up on this stuff or not, it seems really hard to get any kind of proof or valid information. For these sources, I mean, do you think that's a credible thing? Do you entertain the idea of these ancient giant skeletons, or do you think that that's kind of uh, a hoax? Well, I think that in the past, large-sized humans did exist. And even as part of ordinary science, that before five or 10,000 years ago, uh, most living things were bigger than they are today. The animals were bigger. The plants were bigger. You know, I live in California. You go into the Sierra Nevada mountains, you can see the California redwood trees, mm -hmm. and they're huge. Some of them are over three or four hundred feet tall. You can the trunks are so big. Sometimes they make roads that go through the the trunks of these trees. Uh, they're amazing. They're actually the largest living things on Earth, and some of them are over 5,000 years old. So I think they're kind of a, a holdover from that earlier time when things were uh, bigger than they are today. So I think there were large-sized humans who existed in the past, but one has to be careful about it. I mean, you see a lot of photographs circulating on the web of, yeah, but they, they generally turn out to be, you know, Photoshop hoaxes. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes you can really identify them. You know, there was a, a very famous one that was circulating all over the web. It's still circulating for many years. So is this huge skeleton, maybe 40 feet long, right. human, in the ground. And there are little scientists, archaeologists around it digging. So I kind of noticed from the bones of the skeleton, you can see the shadows. And from the shadows, you can tell where the sun was. The sun was high and to the rear. Now, behind the uh, huge skull of this creature, there was an archaeologist uh, standing 
and you know, with a shovel in his hand. And according to where the sun, the light source was, he should have been casting a shadow across the skull. Mm-hmm. But he wasn't. So that kind of tipped me off. This is a Photoshop job, and somebody just wasn't careful enough in doing uh, uh, what they're doing. But uh, I think there is evidence that you know you have to search search it out uh very carefully mm-hmm. uh but i think there there is evidence that uh giants were existing and one of the interesting discoveries that was reported in scientific journals starting in france in the uh, latter part of the 19th century, uh, there were some discoveries made at a place called, uh, trying to remember what it was, uh, it was called Castelnau in France. It's a, a place near the town of Montpellier in mm-hmm. France. There was a, a French archaeologist named Georges de la Pouge. And he found, and these are their photographs of these bones in scientific journals. He found arm bones and leg bones that were human, and uh, the uh, the leg bone was a femur or a thigh bone. And if you have a measurement of how big a thigh bone is, you can, you know, physical anthropologists can tell you how big the human would have been mm-hmm. that had had a thigh bone of this size. So they determined that the creature that had this particular thigh bone of this particular length must have been over 11 feet tall. So, wow. so there, there, I think there is some, uh, this is the best documented case that I've seen so far. I'm, I'm very inter- interested in in cases like this, but as you were saying, finding evidence that really stands up to investigation is a little bit difficult. Yes. But this is uh, the best one I've seen so far. Right on. Well, it gives me hope that it's not all just a sham. Uh, (laughs) On the subject of, you know, multiple cataclysms, a lot of people talk about there maybe being six mass extinction events that we've gone through. Um, A huge theme in these ancient writings seems to be a worldwide flood event. I mean, do you think that might have been the last of many major disasters that we've had to overcome? Well, yes. And I, you know, it's interesting. If you look, say, in the ancient Sanskrit writings, they talk about... uh, vast cycles of time and and one of the units of these cycles is called the kalpa or the day of brahma it lasts for about 4 billion 320 million years and it's divided into sub cycles called manvantars that each last about 300 million years and according to the ancient sanskrit calendar we're now in the middle of the seventh Manvantar of the current Kalpa that we're in. So if we're in the seventh Manvantar, that means there have been six Manvantar cycles before us Mm -hmm. in this creation cycle. And according to the ancient Sanskrit text, between each Manvantar there is a devastation involving a flood which wipes out life on Earth. And if we're in the seventh month of the that means there have been six of these devastations before us, which matches up with what modern science says, that over the past couple of billion years, there have been six major extinction events spaced at intervals of several hundred million years. So it's kind of interesting that there are parallels. Yeah between what modern paleontology says and what some of these ancient wisdom texts say about uh, the history of life on Earth and the repeated catastrophes that have taken place. Now, according now, 
this gets back to uh, the multi-level universe that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. After the, you know, so on our level of reality, there have been periodic devastations that have wiped out life on Earth. But the means for repopulating the Earth exist at higher levels of the cosmos. It's like now many people are into what they call cloud computing, yes, which means that you keep your files and your programs on some server up in the cloud, as they mm -hmm. call it, which means that if your smartphone or computer gets destroyed or damaged, you, know, you can always get another device and download your pictures and songs and yeah. files and programs which are kept up on the cloud. So I think a similar thing operates in, in the universe. Things can get destroyed on this level of reality. Modern science admits there have been these big extinction events. The ancient wisdom traditions talk about them as well, huge devastations that take place and wipe out life on Earth. But higher beings at that higher level of reality have the means and the resources to repopulate the earth when that happens. And I think that has happened repeatedly. Yeah, it's, that's a really interesting concept. I mean, that's kind of like how genetic memory works. People uh, talk about the possibility that instincts and things like that are actually memory, you know, some type of genetic memory that we can tap into as if each human is a computer tapping back into that cloud of information. Yeah, something something like that. Uh, of course, I would explain it in a slightly different way that, you know, the soul or the conscious self maintains contact with a subtle body of mind and intelligence that incorporates memories. So mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. one lifetime, you know, a whole group of memories would be imprinted in the mind and intelligence. And when at the time of death, the soul leaves the body, it goes with the subtle body of mind and intelligence so that over many, many lifetimes, it accumulates in, yeah. in other words, in our minds today, there are memories not just from this lifetime, but memories from perhaps many millions of lifetimes that we've existed on this planet in human bodies and plant bodies, animal bodies, so that sometimes we have memories of things that just didn't occur in this life or in dreams these things may come out we may see things or hear things or experience things in dreams that we really can't trace to anything that's happened to us in this life. Mm -hmm. Or many people often have the experience of meeting someone that they've never met before in this life, but still they feel some relationship with that person, some strong connection with that person, I, I would say it could be a either a memory from a past life that we were connected with this person in a past life, and now we're reestablishing that connection in this life. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes people have these deja vu experiences. They go to a place they've never been to in this life, but they feel they've been there before, perhaps in a yeah. past life. So I think we we do tap into a whole reservoir of memories and experiences that is not limited to our present experience in this body and this lifetime. Yeah, it, it's fascinating stuff, and it's a, a wonder why people today would rather watch football than explore those weird things about life. But um, I wanted to ask you another question about cataclysms. There seems to be like a lot of oral traditions, or at least a couple, where people talk about other types of global catastrophes other than a flood, particularly asteroids. Do you think that there's been times where, you know, there's been some type of impact that has wiped out huge amounts of humanity, but yet little pockets have survived to pass on 
those type of oral stories? Uh, absolutely, and I think uh, it's a it's a, a kind of evidence that can help us show how long humans have actually been on this planet. You know, uh, and I think it was just last year that people in Russia, you know, saw this huge meteor go streaking across the sky. You know, they recorded it on, on uh, cell phone cameras mm-hmm. and things like that, and it smashed into the earth. You know, I, I think people have been witnessing such things for thousands, even millions of years, and it's recorded in some of their 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 legends. There's some interesting cases in Australia where you know scientists have located impact craters, places where asteroids asteroids or comets or meteors have smashed into the earth and left yeah. craters. And the interesting thing is that local Australian Aboriginal people have in their legends accounts that, you know, for example, a star fell down at this place. Now, what's really interesting is that scientists have been able to date these craters. There's one other place called Wolf's Creek in Australia, in Central Australia. And according to geologists, it's 300,000 years old. But the, 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 the local tribe of Australian Aboriginal people that lives near there has legends about a star falling and hitting the earth. And that would tend to indicate that they people saw this 300,000 years ago and kept it in their legends. Now, according to modern science, uh, the human species, humans of our kind, are less than 200,000 years old, and they think the first humans uh, came to Australia about 70,000 years ago. But there's this 300,000-year-old crater, and Australian Aboriginal people have legends about a star falling and making it. it, it it's ev- I take it yeah, as yeah. evidence that humans existed long before scientists now believe. There, there's another crater, impact crater, in Australia at a place called Goss, Goss's Bluff. And it's millions of years old, and the local people have a legend about how a star or celestial object fell at that place, making it, which indicates to me that people were existing millions of years ago to observe these things. At least that's the way that I look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. It's so exciting when ancient legends and modern science cross paths. That's that mysterious sweet spot that I love to hit. Um but man, that pretty much does it for us. I could bounce questions off you all day. You're a fascinating guy. Thanks for doing this. I mean, would you like to tell people a little bit about your website and what you got going on now? Okay, the main website for people interested in my work is mcremo.com, M C R E M O.com. And there they can find uh, my schedule of lectures and interviews. They can also find information about all of my books, like Forbidden Archaeology, where I talk about the archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity, Uh, my book Human Devolution, in Mm -hmm. which I get into some of these uh, things that are related to consciousness and extraterrestrial life and the interactions of humans and ex- extraterrestrials. Uh, my latest book, My Science, My Religion, which is a collection of 24 papers that I presented on these topics at major international scientific conferences. So information about these books can be found on my website, mcremo.com. I also have a Facebook page, Michael Cremo, It's Really Me, and I can be followed on Twitter at uh, Michael Cremo. So, awesome. A lot of ways to uh, follow what I'm doing. For sure, man. Well, 
Thanks again. You know, this has definitely been awesome. One of my favorites. I uh, definitely appreciate you taking the time. Good luck to you and keep digging. My pleasure. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. For sure, man. Enjoy the day. Bye bye. 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 Uh, I thought that was pretty solid stuff, man. I mean, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, interesting uh, guy. Lot, lots of uh, material there to chew over. Uh, <laughs> definitely <laughs> makes you think about all this and the history of uh, our planet and us. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that alternative history stuff. One of the major players that everybody always talks about is Zachariah Stitchin and that whole theme of being engineered by the Anunnaki to be a slave race mining gold and I I don't know. For that particular story, I'm just like, wouldn't it be easier for an advanced race just to make gold than to engineer a <laughs> biological species of slaves that got out of control and now have conquered the planet? Uh, wouldn't it be easier yeah. just to use alchemy? Well, maybe there's some greater design we're not capable of understanding, Greg. <laughs> I, <laughs> I thought not. it's interesting I asked him about... Uh, what is our role, uh, you know, humans? <laughs> yes. Are we really important, all this? Uh, and, uh, you know, his comment was interesting that uh, humans, and he uh, intimated there's possibly all kinds of human, different human species throughout the yeah. cosmos. We're basically a little car to drive around in, you know, the, uh, for consciousness to uh, put itself in as we go through the this evolution or wherever we're going so that that makes uh sense yeah i get it you know (laughs) right i mean it's all i mean from my perspective it's all guesswork i'm just some idiot stoner but (laughs) i mean the world is it is a mysterious place and lately when people have been telling me that something isn't possible because we we'd have had evidence of that you know i just saw this week two things caught on film for the first time uh stories of these things one of them a fish jumped out of water and ate a bird that was flying by and there was a big headline you know first time ever captured on on film and then it's it's pretty cool to see but the second thing was that uh they found out that spiders make replicas of themselves in their web using insect bodies and twigs to kind of make a fake spider for whatever it is for decoy purposes or maybe just to scare off predators 